Uh, it's a few minutes after, so I think we'll get started. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, today, we were just chatting. We're just we're sort of shifting gears a little bit. We're moving away from sort of the physics and regional hemispheric processes of sea ice, and we're getting into the biology of sea ice. Uh, I know Stephanie has some slides of nice brown mats at the bottom of sea ice, so we'll see those in her talk, and I'm sure Carly has some of those as well. Uh, so this week we have Dr. Carly Campbell from the University from UIT in Norway and we have Stephanie Lim who's a PhD candidate from Stanford University in the United States uh, and like I said they're going to be giving two talks on sea ice algae. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Carly who's going to go first and as per usual if you have any questions feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, and we'll save them for the end of Carly's chat. And then uh, at that time, we'll also just use the raise hand function and go through questions that way. So Carly, I'll let you take it away. Start by the age old sharing screen. Well, you can see. Yeah. Looks good. Looks okay, sounds okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dave. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Carly Campbell, and I'm up here uh, 10 p.m. in uh, northern Norway at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Um, and today, uh, I guess, first of all, thanks for the invitation to, to speak, because I jump at any opportunity to talk about sea ice algae, of course. Um, but today we're going to take a perspective looking at how we can study sea ice as a living and a, and a breathing system. So rather than um, a, a static medium, looking at it from the viewpoint that it has the capacity to uptake and release biologically relevant gases. And of course, uh, there was some mention uh, on Twitter uh, about ice algae party, algae are a uh, central feature stars of this party, um, but they're not the only thing to consider. So before we begin, I thought we'd start with some context on the environment that we're talking about. Um, I always like to share this photo. It's of Canadian Arctic uh, first year sea ice with a level snow cover during spring. It's usually at least when I'm up north. And maybe it's a seemingly desolate place uh, with a few uh, exceptions here with my very enthusiastic graduate students. But in the context of biology and certainly from uh, my perspective as a sea ice algal researcher, snow covered sea ice is in itself a habitat. It provides a substrate for colonization. Uh, by a range of my marine microorganisms. Uh, so with this in mind, seasonally and at its maximum, sea ice represents really one of the largest biomes on Earth. Um, this is one of the largest collection of biological communities, if you will, with a shared climate. So despite its bleak appearance, like I said, there is life within sea ice. Um, there are algae, these are our photosynthetic organisms contributing to the base of the marine food web. Uh, we also have microorganisms, of course, like bacteria, shown here in orange, and fungi, like the chytrid in the top right corner, that's co-occurring uh, or infecting a sea ice diatom. Now, the last bit of context um, that I'll illustrate is that most studies on sea ice biogeochemistry uh, and algae, and I'm no exception to this, occur, they happen in the spring period, and they focus on the bottom ice. Um, and that's also inherently going to be the focus of uh, what I'll what I'll share with you today. Um, this is what's illustrated on this figure here, both for first year ice and multi ice at different latitudes in the Arctic. It's a generalization, um, but it gives you an idea here that in the spring, this is uh, the most heavily studied period because it's when we get the stimulated growth of ice algae due to the availability of light. And I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, hopefully, but you can see that in the upper panel of this illustration, where we have an increase in downwelling of PAR or photosynthetically active radiation. Um, the amount of light that's actually available to the sea ice algae, of course, is really dependent on the distribution of snow on the sea ice. It's inversely related, and that's what's highlighted by this inset graph here, where you have snow on your primary axis and PAR transmittance on your secondary axis, and you can see that they're inversely related to one another. Now, because of the variable distribution of snow on sea ice, both over the spring melt period is shown here, and with wind-driven redistribution of snow drifts, um, that translates to a lot of spatiotemporal variability in the distribution of microorganisms like algae, algae uh, in the ice. So the microorganisms in sea ice are impacted by, and they also affect the geochemistry of the ice itself through their activity. 
algae through their photosynth photosynthetic uptake of uh, CO2 and release of oxygen. And then also with bacteria and fungi, which are entirely heterotrophic, using oxygen and releasing CO2 through the process of respiration. Um, but it's important to keep in mind, and this is at the forefront of my mind in the research that I'm conducting, is that there's an energetic cost to living in this harsh sea ice environment that uh, is likely at times to even push these photosynthetic algal cells to use their energy reserves and rely on the process of respiration to access them. So it's important to keep in mind, although we talk about ice algae as primary producers um, and fixing carbon dioxide, they absolutely use this reverse process of respiration, taking up oxygen and releasing CO2 um, in that way. And this raises the question, um, is respiration an important or a minor or major uh, process during this heavily studied period of spring algal blooms? Um, and approaching this question is really going to be a focus of what, uh, what I cover in the remainder of the presentation, although it's also important to keep in mind that beyond biological activity, of course, there's non-biological influences on how these biologically relevant gases um, may be present in sea ice. Things like decreasing salinity and temperature, facilitating greater dissolution of gases in the sea ice brines. So that's really important to keep in mind as well. And always asking myself, well, why do I care about this question? Although I have obviously uh, my own love for sea ice algae in the topic. Ultimately, it's important to understand whether we can consider the sea ice as a net autotrophic or heterotrophic system, so whether it has a net release or uptake of oxygen, because that affects how it uh, influences the transfer of gases between our atmosphere and our ocean, and ultimately how these microorganis microorganisms contribute um, to the overall trophic system. Okay, so that brings us to the next, uh, I guess, overarching question or focus, and that is looking at oxygen within sea ice. So perhaps um, take this further, we're going to be looking at investigating this assumption in my mind that sea ice during the heavily studied spring period, that is the productive period, is an autotrophic system. And it's considered to be that way uh, because of this known presence of sea ice algae and their photosynthetic activity. So we're going to challenge that a little bit uh, on the next few slides and also study the potential or the presence of spatiotemporal variability of oxygen production in this environment. So in other words, uh, this is my last algae joke, I promise. Let's get this algae party started. Okay, so we'll begin with a lab-based study uh, from Ronnie Glued in 2002. And I highlight this study because I think it really nicely illustrates the variability in um, oxygen, both because of biological as well as physical reasons. Um, and this study is using oxygen uh, electrodes. So on your left panel, you can see oxygen um, over distance from a concentrated filter with ice algae or biofilm. Um, and these measurements were taken under three different light intensities, uh, low, moderate, and high. And from their measurements, you can see that with greater light intensity, you have a greater production of oxygen. And that makes sense when we keep in mind this process of photosynthesis. Now in the next panel is from the same study, and it's the insertion of this oxygen electrode into a growing piece of sea ice that's been inoculated with ice algae. The same piece of ice with the same amount of algae. And the three lines indicate uh, inherent variability trying to take measurements, let's say in situ, or in this case, uh, in vivo. Um, so in a perfect world, these measurements would have given perhaps the same numbers, but uh, keeping in mind, oxygen is not only dependent on the algae in place, but also fine scale variability in things like salinity and temperature as well, that really makes it a huge challenge to be conducting these types of measurements uh, within ice environments. So putting these ideas uh, into practice, I present here some preliminary data from uh, one of my last trips uh, to the Arctic. This was taken from Cambridge Bay, which is the site of the Canadian High Arctic Research Station last spring. Um, and these are measurements from the bottom two and a half centimeters of uh, sea ice at two locations. The oxygen measurements from the bottom of the ice are done using uh, Winkler titration. And the two sites were chosen for reasons that I won't go into a lot of detail here, but essentially they had different amounts of sub-ice turbulence that were thought to stimulate 
different uh, levels of productivity in ice. Um, so what you're seeing are temporal trends in oxygen within the bottom of the ice. And comparing that in this larger graph um, to chlorophyll A in the bottom ice, um, so the low turbulence site is blue on both graphs and the orangey yellow is the higher turbulence site, we can see that the trends in oxygen roughly follow that of chlorophyll A. So perhaps this is an example of biological influence on oxygen gas in the ice. Um, but before, I guess we get ahead of ourselves, or certainly me, as I'm, this is preliminary data, so I'm still very much process um, of working through it. You might have also noticed that actually, if you compare the oxygen in the bottom two and a half centimeters um, between these two sites, that the oxygen was actually uh, lower at the high turbulence site, the site with higher chlorophyll A. So that's actually counterintuitive um, when we're thinking about this biological influence of oxygen in the ice. Um, and really, this makes a critical next step in interpreting this data, correcting for differences in salinity and temperature between these uh, different sites. Um, you can already have a hint that there's absolutely differences if we look at their relative um, brine composition. Um, so keeping that in mind, this need to correct for uh, physical changes in the ice in order to interpret biological signals uh, kind of bring us to the next example which is the use of an underwater eddy covariance signal. Interpreting the physical from the biological is critical um, if we really want to make sense of these type of data. Um, these images on your screen here are from our last deployment um, with an underwater eddy covariance system that was on a transect to the North Pole in August, and we'll be redeploying it uh, this oof, five weeks away already in Fram Strait. Um, and if you're not familiar with this system, it provides the ability to measure dissolved oxygen and the three-dimensional velocity of particles about 20 centimeters away from the ocean ice interface. And from that, then we can evaluate or calculate fluxes of oxygen into or out of the ice. So getting back to this question of net heterotrophy and autotrophy. And I think it's a really exciting, um, although complicated piece of equipment. It offers potential to really be looking at these oxygen fluxes over uh, larger spatial scales. Um, but once again, this difficulty in, in interpreting physical from the biological signals in the footprint is not a trivial one. But luckily, people like um, Brent Else have been working on this um, for a number of years now. And so this is some example data from uh, underwater edu covariance system that Brent deployed in Baffin Bay. And he applied the equation in your bottom left screen, which I also won't go into details about, but essentially it normalized uh, the eddy covariance data to remove this fluctuating influence of temperature and salinity. So it can really zero in on bi biological signal. And by doing that, that's what's presented here as dissolved oxygen flux, as well as the incoming uh, light availability. What Brent found was that there was strong diurnal variability during this ice algal bloom in the spring that was inversely related to the availability of light. So once again, thinking back to photosynthetic organisms, this is pretty interesting and is uh, intuitive. So what he found was that there was peak autotrophy or release of oxygen um, at a time that roughly corresponded to solar noon, while peak heterotrophy or consumption of oxygen by the ice occurred within about three hours of daily solar minimum. So once again, this is showing strong potential for diurnal variability in production of ice algal blooms. And those types of measurements are really hard, if not impossible, to get to with point-based incubations. So from Brent's work, we saw that there are times, at least, of oxygen consumption by the ice or times of net heterotrophy. Um, so supporting this idea of the importance of respiration as a process to consider in the spring. And the next two pieces of evidence um, that I'll present are really based on the system that I developed as part of my PhD, and that's what's highlighted on uh, the slide here. And it's also a big piece of instrumentation that we're using in the micro CO lab um, that I'm leading here at UIT. So just briefly, in this method, we take oxygen sensors, um, we put them into gas type bottles um, that contain the melted CI sample, and then those bottles are incubated over a range of light intensities. 
I should note that those samples have grazing organisms that would be maybe artificially affecting the respiration signal removed before they're, they're incubated. And so what we get then is a measurement of oxygen driven by the biology over time from which we can create a photosynthesis irradiance model of production to really get at productivity in situ or at in situ light intensities. So in applying this uh, system, this is an example data set um, that is taken actually back uh, also from Cambridge Bay, but during more of the, the beginning years of my PhD. So to walk you through this graph a little bit, you have net community production calculated from that incubation setup, both on your primary and your secondary axes. But here you have it calculated per hour, and that corresponds to the individual bars across this spring bloom. And then you also have it calculated on a daily integrated value, and these are your point-based measurements. And there's sort of two sets of data shown here. Think of it as a lower and upper range of possible net community production. And those are calculated really just to reflect uh, uncertainty and light availability to the algae themselves. And what we saw um, by, by doing this over a spring algal bloom was that there was absolutely periods of the spring season where we had consistent net heterotrophy from these incubations, so net uptake of oxygen. And this uh, heterotrophic phase corresponded to what we would, I guess I would characterize as stagnant accumulation of chlorophyll A or POC in the ice. Um, and I also wanna point out that that net uptake of oxygen from this incubation method, um, the amounts of oxygen that were taken up could not be accounted for by measurements taken separately of bacterial production. So this uh, highlights the potential for heterotrophy during the spring bloom that is sourced from non-bacteria uh, organisms at least. So going back to this idea of ice algal respiration as potentially being important. And one other thing to note from this study, um, and that really got me, I guess, down the dark hole of ice algal taxonomy, which is something now that I, I really enjoy doing, but the timing of the switch during this algal bloom from net heterotrophy to autotrophy corresponded to, there's my mouse, a switch in the dominance of community, a switch from a pennate to a centric diatom, potentially raising questions about the role of species composition in driving um, these net heterotrophic autotrophic uh, events. So a second example or application of that opt-out system I described, uh, we now go to uh, the high Arctic in the Lincoln Sea. And this is some work from one of my more recently published papers in Alimenta. Um, so we took this opt-out incubation with melted ice samples in it to measure net community production. And we combined that with 24 hour measurements of downwelling light as well as uh, measurements of light transmittance taken by this ROV here, driven by Christian Catlin, who maybe a number of you will know. And with all of that together, we're able to calculate net community production and units of oxygen on the flow scale. So that's what's shown here in this short little video um, on the scale of about 150 meters by 150 meters. And what you can see as this video uh, goes through time, a 24 hour uh, day period, we see variability in the amount of oxygen consumed um, as it shifts from green towards purple, indicating greater oxygen uptake. And we can also get a bit more of a handle on the spatial variability of this production, as you can see, um, sort of mimicking what you can imagine in one of the, the first picture I showed you with the snow driven distribution um, across the ice surface. So spatial temporal variability in oxygen uh, production. And one last thing to note here is the scale and that the production was so low during the study that it was actually consistently heterotrophic uh, while we were in the Lincoln Sea. Okay, I think I'm doing pretty okay on time. Um, so with that, I have one last example to highlight, um, still keeping with this idea of net heterotrophy and the importance of respiration. And for this final uh, two pieces, I suppose, of evidence, I bring in some examples of molecular methods. Um, with these documenting, uh, I guess, evidence for the, the need or low oxygen or even no oxygen environments to exist. Um, both of these examples are from times of ice algal blooms in the spring 
and during times of perhaps comparatively low chlorophyll on the left uh, versus high chlorophyll environments on the right. So on the left, this is a study from Soren Rice Card and Runny Glued in 2004. Um, this is in a fjord in Young Sound in Greenland, which apologies, obviously Young Sound is not in the middle of Greenland. Uh, it was just off my map, but you get the idea. Fairly low chlorophyll. Um, and what you see here is depth of sea ice sampled and a measure of uh, denitrification, which was done uh, through experiments. A denitrification is a process where uh, that's converting bioavailable nitrate to N2 gas. And that's a process that's done by anaerobic bacteria. That is bacteria that need oxygen-free conditions. And what you can see also in this panel beside it is that the presence of denitrification corresponds to part of the ice where the lowest amounts of oxygen were measured. Uh, on the right here then, we have some work by Chris Bayless, um, which was part of the Diatom Arctic project I was leaving, leading um, a few years ago now um, in my last postdoc in the UK. Um, it's in prep, uh, hopefully to be submitted soon. What's shown here is relative abundance of uh, MEGS over uh, three, four different sample locations. The sample locations are not important, but what I want to highlight, I suppose, first of all, uh, me MEGS are metagenomic assembled genomes. And the way that they're interesting in the context of this question here is that they're sequences of genetic code for metabolic pathways of prokaryotes or bacteria. So they tell us information about what types of metabolisms might be occurring in the ice. Here, they're divided between sulfur and nitrogen metabolisms. So on your y-axis, you have relative abundance of these pieces of genetic code um, over different specific metabolisms. And if you focus on just site F, which is the green on this figure, you see the presence of denitrification and nitrogen reduction pathways, um, which again are processes that require little to no oxygen to occur. So collectively, with these two studies in mind, I suppose that piece of evidence that I'm trying to wrap up, um, wrap up with is that if these metabolic pathways exist in sea ice and they need little to no oxygen to exist, then, of course, naturally, um, those conditions must be present in sea ice, even in uh, presence of significant uh, photosynthetic organisms like ice algae. So with that, um, I would just say that revisiting this original question of respiration, well, I think it's pretty evident that I think, I personally think, yes, it's very important, but at the very least, we need to be considering it and be taking measurements, um, oxygen-based measurements during our studies of the spring ice algal blooms. This is work that is very much ongoing as part of the BREATHE project um, that I'm leading here at UIT. Um, and if I could put a quick um, uh, advertisement out, we're, we're about to be looking for a modeling, a postdoc based at Norwegian Polar Institute to bring in this idea of respiration as well as turbulent driven uh, nutrient supply to ice algal blooms in biogeochemical chemical models. Um, so keep an eye open for that advertisement soon. And I hope to speak uh, more about this and see many of you at the IGS this June. So I think um, that's it for me. Great. Thanks so much, Carly. That was fantastic. And uh, on time, I think, right? There. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right on time. Perfect. Uh, we'll open it up to any questions. There's none in the chat, but feel free to use the, the raise hand there. Maybe while people are deciding what their question is, I was hoping to ask about that uh, dominant species switch and what drives that? That seemed kind of like a big deal in that whole transition. And yeah, what are those species? <laughs> I don't know what what causes that. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a loaded question, I suppose, and it's uh, also an important uh, avenue of research um, that I think is ongoing, at least by my group and probably a number of others out there. This idea of there are thousands of species of algae that make up ice algal blooms. This is maybe um, an example of how a transition between species can affect the biochemistry of the ice. What actually drives species transi transitions, so species preference for different conditions, is a pretty big unknown. There's some generalizations like flagellate functional groups tend to do well in really low nutrients and maybe really low salinities. 
Um, but the change I showed was a switch from a penny diatom to a centric diatom. So we're still talking diatoms. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I don't exactly know, at least in that paper, there was specul or I speculated it had to do with um, kind of the perfect storm of light and low salinity conditions that facilitated this growth of centric, centric diatom. But I think it's a really interesting avenue of research, especially when we're thinking about well, what's happening, looking to the future with climate change. Uh, species selection and species changes, I think, is a um, big topic. Cool, thanks. Interesting. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah, me. Hi, Carly. It's Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, I have a question kind of linked to that question. Can you talk a little bit more about like the nutrient conditions and how that interplays with like the switch in taxonomy or the the respiration rates? Yeah, I guess it and it goes back to the the needs uh, for constrained lab experiments on multiple species of ice algae. A lot of uh, my work and a lot of work in general in the field has been done on uh, well in the field on mixed. Uh, live cultures and to answer those questions about um, say selection of species or influence of nutrient limitation on productivity um, we we need very controlled means of doing that in the lab um, if you're asking about uh, what does what facilitates low nutrients and and how that affects production i think you know that answer even better than i do of course um, the breathe project is also looking at how um, this idea of mixing like in laura dolman's paper how greater mixing under the ice uh, actually enhances nutrient supply and facilitates greater production um, but it's interesting to me that these measurements of net heterotrophy seem to be popping up uh, the more i use oxygen probes and they pop up in blooms of low, moderate, very high chlorophyll um, okay. at times of low, moderate, high light and nutrients. Um, so again, I don't, I don't have the answer, but it is intuitive that if you have limiting conditions for a photosynthetic organism, then you're gonna drive them more towards using uh, their internal stores in the process of respiration. Okay, I think that yeah, kind of answers my question, thanks. Sorry, I think I went on a tangent, but it was a good question. I have one last quick question about the spatial variability in oxygen uptake that you saw with the with the ROV. Is that related to strictly ice thickness and snow cover above, or are there other variables that that drive that? Yeah, I guess I I didn't um, in that study. It was sort of. <laughs> It was a big task to get to the point of characterizing that level of spatial temporal variability. Um, and I can't say that I loved working with the ROV data, although many thanks to co-authors uh, for their assistance there. Inherently, um, I mean, you, you see when you're when you're working on a flow, you see the direct impact of the snow depth on the light, then on the distribution of chlorophyll in the ice. So I think um, that's still a dominant factor there. There have been, uh, or there are measurements, of course, that where you have, say, uh, a meter over here versus meter over here, and you have differences in chlorophyll A because of light availability, different snow covers. Uh, because of the differential growth, you can also get variability in um, nutrient demand, nutrient supply. Inherently, where you have more ice algae growing, they grow faster, they use up the nutrients that are immediately available, and they're more likely to reach an acclimation state that shows nutrient limitation first, if that makes sense. So you can still get this variability um, in um, nutrient state, even if light is the dominant controlling factor, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you, even if you had like a homogeneous ice cover and snow cover, you would still expect some level of variability within that system. You could, at least under a system, like that was in the Lincoln Sea where there was very low uh, nitrate. So the whole system was very nitrogen limited, which is often the case in a lot of places in the Arctic. But maybe if you went somewhere like um, near Resolute Bay, where you have a lot of nutrients available all the time, 
that would be um, less evident because you're not limited because more and more nutrients are coming up from the water column. Yeah, interesting. Oh yeah, Hester. Yeah, um, this is completely like off topic maybe, but I'm just wondering, you've heard of Snowball Earth because like I talked about <laughs> Um, so in the Carolinian oceans, the algae are supposed to be really important for um, producing um, a, a biology and like uh, chemistry to open up like an explosion of, of other types of uh, life forms after. So I'm I'm just wondering if at all in your research in like studying the current sea ice, is there anything that we can link to? the deglaciation in the global earth uh, environment because that was all sea ice and that was the yeah. algae that, that were reacting to that. So I'm just wondering if, if that connection is made at all. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting perspective. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, scientists, uh, Patricia Baracaldo Sanchez at University of Bristol. And she, her expertise is using genomics to look at uh, the evolution of photosynthesis since Snowball Earth. And so we've been speaking a lot recently, she actually came up here to UIT um, maybe a month ago, about bringing our science together a bit more. That would be more in the context of uh, photosynthesis from cyanobacteria. Um, so dealing more with prokaryotes and getting away more from the sea ice diatoms. But uh, I would say it's a relatively new avenue of research that I'm starting to work with people that know a lot more about it than I do. But I think there's absolutely parallels there to be made. Thanks. Interesting. Great. Well, thanks so much, Carly. Thanks for staying up so late and for uh, volunteering to give this talk. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, and with that, we're going to head over to Stephanie. who is at a normal time of work, but is extremely jet lagged. So the opposite end of, uh, of being overtired. Wow. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah, I just got back from India two days ago. So my body is confused, but hopefully my mind is clear enough to uh, take you through this journey on CI biology. So I'm excited to share our work on sea ice biology and its dependence on the sea ice environment. Um, and in particular, I work on larger scales than Carly has shown you, so it's a bit of a different perspective. Of course, sea ice algae are single-celled microalgae that live attached to or in the sea ice, um, and they're usually concentrated in the bottom few centimeters of the ice, as seen in this uh, really rich brown layer on the bottom of these ice flows here. Um, and that's because this location is optimal growing space and access to both light and nutrients. So today I'll show you how we've used satellite and model products of sea ice, um, many of which are created by people in IGS or even in the Zoom room, to get large-scale estimates of ice algal habitat. But first, why do we care about ice algae? Ice algae are a pretty small proportion of overall primary production in the polar oceans, um, but they can be important both locally and seasonally. So they're up to 24% of production in the sea ice zone in the Antarctic and can be up to 40% of production in the central Arctic basin. Most importantly, they're the first group of primary producers to bloom after polar night. And so they form a really rich and important food source for grazers or um, as a source of carbon to the benthos. Ice algal habitat is controlled at least to a first order by sea ice area, so there must be sea ice for them to grow in, and by light transmission, so there must be enough light that makes it through the snow and the ice to the bottom ice uh, to support photosynthesis. Knowing these things, we looked at a time series of each pole of how the sea ice environment has been changing to really answer the question of how recent variability in the sea ice environment has affected the amount of ice algal habitat. And I like to think of this as leveraging the natural variability as an experiment so that we can understand what environmental factors are important for ice algae um, and even make some predictions about what might happen in the future. Specifically, I've used a very similar method in both the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, but they tell really different stories. So I'll start with the Antarctic where I'll introduce the methods and then later on in the talk, I'll get to the Arctic. <clears throat> 
to set the scene a little bit, uh, CS Extent has been doing some really weird things in the Antarctic recently, as I'm sure many of you know. So here I'm showing you time on the x-axis over our time series, which is 2004 to 2019. Um, and on the y-axis, this is deviation from um, an annual climatology. So you can see that up until 2015, sea ice extent in the Antarctic was steady or even increasing slightly. And then, there, and then in 2016, there was this really dramatic drop off of about 2 million square kilometers over three years. I like to say that this is more than the size of Mexico, or it's equivalent to 30 years of sea ice loss in the Arctic. The exact trend depends, of course, on where you draw the time series. Um, but at least over the course of my time series, this was equivalent to uh, 50,000 square kilometers lost per year. That's just what's going on with sea ice extent in the Antarctic. Um, but of course, there are other factors that affect ice algae. In particular, um, at least according to some recent passive microwave products, there was a decrease of one centimeter per decade over Antarctic sea ice um, of snow. And while this may seem small, snow is really highly attenuating of light, um, so this could be important. And then we tested a couple of other factors. Uh, the ones I'll introduce you to for now is at least over our time series, there was no trend in ice thickness or in the timing of the bottom ice melt. And the timing of bottom ice melt is important because um, as the bottom of the ice melts, the algae slough off or fall off very rapidly in the period of a couple of days. And so we consider this the termination of an ice algal bloom. So to understand the effect of these different factors, uh, we combined 16 years of satellite and model data uh, of the entire Antarctic, which we break up into 25 kilometer grid cells. For each grid cell, we model radiative transfer uh, to the ice algal layer and calculate whether or not there's enough light to be supporting uh, photosynthesis for ice algae. What this looks like in detail is I take snow from this passive microwave product and apply this as the mean over the 25 kilometer grid cell. But we know that snow is really highly spatially variable, and so I actually apply a log normal sub grid cell distribution in which I divide that grid cell into nine sub grid cells surrounding the mean. I then model the ice thickness thermodynamically uh, based on the heat balance between the atmosphere, the ice, and the ocean, um, taking into account factors like the snow depth and the sea ice motion. I then model radiative transfer, so I reflect some of it off the surface of the snow, and then I follow a Beer's law or an exponential decay formulation through the snow and ice layers. And so I'm calculating how much light is making it to the top of the algal layer, algal layer, which I consider the bottom five centimeters of the ice. Based on the light that makes it there, I calculate a photosynthetic rate, and then I subtract a constant respiration rate. I do this calculation every three hours, and then I sum over 24 hours. If that number is net positive, then I say that that subgrid cell is habitable. So in this little schematic on the six subgrid cells to the right, we have thinner snow, higher light transmission, and those uh, subgrid cells end up being habitable. Where on the right, there's thicker snow, lower light transmission, and they're not habitable. So then overall, this entire grid cell would be two thirds habitable. And if, I just wanna pause here to mention that we think that this approach, which is really uh, dependent only on light transmission and sort of the physical characteristics of the ice uh, is better constrained than doing something like actively modeling a biological pool, just because the biology um, is so variable and to some extent poorly constrained. So we do this calculation everywhere, every day during the growing season. And here's what one year in the Antarctic looks like. So I'm about to show you a little video that starts in June and it continues through January. Uh, the darker colors are less habitable and the brighter colors are more habitable. And I'll remind you that because of that uh, subgrid cell distribution, we can get a number anywhere from zero to one on a given day. And then you'll see that the grid cells start to turn white when they reach the timing of bottom ice melt. So you can see that polar night is sort of falling back to the higher latitudes, 
And then you can see that the bottom of the ice is melting and terminating the blooms. So I'll let you watch that one, watch that one more time. So now that we have these numbers over the entire season, how do we come up with a quantifiable number? So we came up with a metric of habitat days. Um, and to walk you through that, here I'm showing you just a screenshot from the previous video, right? So again, the colors go from zero to one at any given grid cell. And then we sum over the course of the year so that now our colors go from zero to 100. And then we integrate over a region. So the metric of habitat days is analogous to degree days in the sense that it covers or it integrates across two axes, in this case, space and time. But we recognize that you know, 674 million is a pretty big number and hard to conceptualize. So then we normalize to the ice area. In this case, I've normalized to the total winter maximum ice extent in the Antarctic. And you can think of this as the spatial average of the bloom duration. So if the entire Antarctic ice cover were habitable for a hundred were habitable, it would be for 35 days. Or if only 50% of the Antarctic ice cover were habitable, it would be for 70 days. And we can normalize to whatever area we're interested in. So here I'm showing you for the entire Antarctic, but you could also do that for a latitudinal band or for a region or even for an individual grid cell. So moving us to the results, we found that 81% of Antarctic sea ice in an average year is habitable for at least 14 days. And that's shown in this bright yellow color here. And then if we look at the trend, there was a 2.6 day increase in the normalized habitat days across our 16 year time series. But I think most importantly, if you remember that sort of big drop off in sea ice extent in 2016, there's not a clear signal of how that was affecting Antarctic ice algae. And we think that this indicates that even though there's a smaller ice area, there was basically a more intense or concentrated habitat. We wanted to know why this was, so we broke up the Antarctic into these five pretty commonly used geographic sectors, and we put a bunch of environmental variables and normalized habitat days into a multiple linear regression. And we found that the factor that explained the most variation was snow depth, which explained about 30% of the variation. This seems plausible because I'll remind you that uh, snow depth was decreasing over our time period. And so this decreasing snow would increase light transmission and probably increase habitat. So here's sort of the first takeaway point for the Antarctic section that there was an increase in habitat over time due to decreasing snow depths. But we also had the question of what controls the spatial patterns in Antarctic ice algal habitat. And as we looked at it, even though these five geographic sectors are pretty commonly used in the Antarctic, they're really not representative of the spatial patterns in Antarctic ice algal habitat. And as we looked more closely, these patterns were remarkably similar to the spatial patterns in the bottom ice melt date. And so this led us to put all of these individual grid cells into a linear regression. And we found that by far, uh, the biggest factor in explaining habitat was melt date, which explained 45% of the variation. I threw a bunch of other things like ice thickness, snow depth, day length, incident light uh, into the regression, and those all explained less than 3% each. These plots are only for 2004 as an example, but if we looked at the spatial patterns in the trends over our 16 year time period, we see that the spatial pattern in the trends in melt date and in habitat days also are remarkably similar. And so this led us to conclude that melt date is the most important factor uh, describing spatial variability, which is in, in fact, uh, probably the larger source of variability rather than temporal variability in the Antarctic. And if we know that melt date is important, then we can sort of work backwards and think about the things that determine melt date um, and why those are important and therefore be able to predict future impacts. So I'll bring you back to the idea that uh, we were growing ice thermodynamically in our model. So this incorporated the atmospheric heat flux driven by air temperatures and snow depth, the latent heat of freezing, which I was holding constant, the oceanic heat flux, and sea ice motion, which is driven by winds and currents. 
many of these things are liable to change in the future, but the ones that I feel like we as a community uh, have the strongest handle on or predictions for are air temperature and snow depth. And to sort of bring this whole section on the Antarctic together for you, I've shown you that Melty explains the most variation in Antarctic ice level habitat. And that melt date is tied to air temperature and to snow depth. So if we think about the future, both of those things, uh, air temperature and at least snowfall, there's the question of whether snowfall uh, equals snow depth accumulation on sea ice. Um, but at least air temperature and snowfall are both predicted in CMIP 6 to increase by 2100. And if we think about how those would likely affect ice algal habitat, both of them would probably decrease habitat. So increasing air temperatures would bring earlier melt dates, um, and then earlier melt dates would terminate blooms sooner. Similarly, snow, snow acts as a buffer between the cold atmosphere and the warmer sea ice. And so increasing snow temperatures, oh sorry, increasing snow depths would also probably lead to earlier melt dates and less habitat. Snow would also have a dual effect of decreasing light transmission um, and decreasing uh, the photosynthetic capabilities of ice algae. So that's sort of the story we have in the Antarctic. Now I will briefly touch on what we're seeing in the Arctic, which is a very different story. So the Arctic, unlike the Antarctic, is seeing a really consistent trend in its sea ice extent. And this is a steady decline in uh, sea ice. Um, but that's not the full story because Arctic sea ice is also getting younger. Uh, so first year ice has increased in its proportion and, it ex and its extent because the Arctic is losing more ice in the summer than in the winter. First year ice is really different from multi-year ice in a few key ways, namely that it's thinner and it has less time to accumulate snow and therefore has a thinner snow cover. So I'm showing you um, over both, over a 34 year time series in this case, that both the ice thickness and the snow depth in the Arctic decreased. So how did all of these changes affect ice algal habitat in the Arctic? Again, we're looking at younger ice, which is thinner and has a thinner snow cover. We ran a very similar analysis, so I won't walk you through the methods again, um, but we do use some different input data sets, which I'm happy to talk about in the questions if there are some. Uh, but we found that the Arctic is generally far less habitable than the Antarctic. So here I'm showing you, again, in the dark colors, shorter uh, lengths of habitat, and in the bright colors, longer lengths. And you can see that in general, the Arctic uh, supports habitat for a much shorter period of time. And then if we use that simple sort of two-week thresholding, uh, only 41% of the Arctic uh, reaches two weeks of habitat, whereas 81% of the Antarctic reaches two weeks of habitat. Over our 34 year time series, we saw a 2.4 day increase in habitat days in the Arctic. And again, I'll remind you that habitat days is a metric that, that accounts for both extent and duration of habitat. Uh, this change was driven by three things, snow depth, ice thickness, and melt date, primarily. And if I think about the trends that we know to be happening to those things, um, in fact, only the decreasing snow depth and the decreasing ice thickness are likely to increase ice algal habitat. So actually, earlier melt dates in the Arctic are probably having the reverse effect in sort of dampening the trend uh, that we're seeing. So if we really think about the fact that snow depth and ice thickness are driving this increase in habitat in the Arctic, I'll remind you that both of those things are tied to the expansion of first year ice. Uh, so I'll I'm here I'm showing on the x axis um, in a given latitudinal band in year the proportion of first year ice and then on the y axis uh, the normalized habitat days in that latitudinal band. So you can see that when there's a greater proportion of first year ice, there's a greater amount of ice algal habitat. So overall, the increase in habitat seems to be tied to the shift towards first year ice. Um, and this can have important implications for the ecosystem. 
namely that if we're seeing increased habitat duration and extent for ice algae, this implies the, the potential for increased primary production. So my work is not directly measuring carbon fixation, but if you think about ice algae existing in more areas for a longer period of time, it seems plausible that uh, they are fixing more carbon and providing more food to the ecosystem. How grazers and how the benthos are likely to uh, respond to this is still unknown. And so to wrap up this Arctic section for you, I've shown you that there was an increase in ice algal habitat in recent years, that this was tied to the shift from multi-year ice to first year ice. Um, but if we think about what this means for the future, if we sort of draw out this graph, a lot of predictions think that the Arctic will be ice free in the summer by about mid-century, at which point we'll have lost all of our first, uh, sorry, all of our multi-year ice. We think that for ice algae, this means that the gain in ice algal habitat is probably short-lived. Um, it's probably only until that point where we switch over to uh, entirely first-year ice that we'll have an increase in ice algal habitat, at which point um, that first-year ice is likely to disappear too, um, and with it, the overall Antarctic, oh, sorry, Arctic ice algal habitat. So I've really um, told you two different stories. So to summarize them, the Antarctic has a lot more habitat than the Arctic, uh, both in terms of extent and in terms of duration. A small note that this doesn't necessarily uh, scale directly to primary production differences between their two poles. Um, those are actually expected to be similar between the two. Uh, but in general, the Antarctic is a story about how high spatial variability is driven primarily by melt date. While the Arctic um, is a story about how over time we've seen a shift towards first year ice, which has increased ice algal habitat, driven by decreases in snow and ice thickness. And together, all of these things show that well, in the recent you know, couple of decades, we've seen increases in ice algal habitat in both poles. Uh, our work also suggests that uh, ice algal habitat is very sensitive to environmental conditions and with future productions is likely to decrease uh, given the current climate conditions. So that's all I have for you. Thanks very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. That was a lot of content, Stephanie. That was that was an impressive <laughs> amount of work. Hopefully, y'all didn't get dizzy from all of it. No, it was good. You did a good job of explaining it very clearly. I liked at the start how you laid it out step by step. There, that was nice. Uh, any questions? Ah, Roger. There we go. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Stephanie. And yeah, fantastic pictures, as as somebody in the chat said. Your, your your thesis examiners will have a good time looking at those, I'm quite sure. <laughs> um, a question about your predicting forward. Um, what about any effects from changes in ocean properties? I mean, you're, you're obviously thinking about the, the downward traveling issues, you know, the snow thickness and, and light transmission down to where you've defined the habitat to be. What, what's gonna hit it from underneath? in terms of changes in ocean chemistry or something like that? Yeah. Um, not, not that I know very, very much about <laughs> ocean chemistry, but uh, just occurred to me it might be something to, that matters. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, the ocean matters a lot to ice algae. Um, I think the two things that I would probably think about first would be the oceanic heat flux or sort of the uh, temperature component and how that affects sea ice growth. Um, I think in general, people think that oceanic heat flux, at least in the Antarctic, is going to increase, um, and that would affect uh, sea ice and make it thinner and probably have shorter seasons. Uh, to an extent, I think that still, even though we don't directly account for oceanic heat flux, I think that's still sort of captured in the ideas behind our analysis uh, with regards to um, ice thickness. Um, the other thing to think about, of course, would be nutrient conditions and whether the surface ocean has fewer nutrients. Um, but luckily, the thing with ice algae is because they're growing early in the season, uh, 
they may be limited by nutrients in the sense that they can't reach their maximum biomass, but there's probably still enough to allow some ice algae to grow. Um, it's really only towards the end of the ice algal season that you have to start thinking about nutrients uh, really seriously limiting. Um, so I think to at least the first order, we would still expect the trends to be similar, maybe uh, some maybe slightly shorter seasons um, due to nutrient limitation, but I think that's probably a um, kind of second order thought. Mushing, thank you. Hmm. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, Alec. No one else has their hand up. Yeah, I was, I was wondering a bit about your thoughts on the ability to use climate models to do this, this type of work. So obviously, a lot of what you're doing is trying to find these relationships, but you're limited by just the one realization of, you know, this this one run that we have uh, of real life. What if, have it, yeah, have you explored models to be able to run ensembles and, and simulations to understand those covariances more, or are they just not quite there yet? Mm. I think it depends on if you're talking about using sort of the environmental outputs from a climate model, which I think you could definitely do. Um, if you're talking about actually including ice algae in a large, um, you know, ecosystem model, I think even in the Arctic, including phytoplankton, uh, or phytoplankton are really poorly uh, represented in models like CESM or other uh, large climate models. So I would be hesitant to think that we could get good answers on ice algae. Yeah, I guess I was thinking like more from like the habitable point of view, which is kind of the step before actually simulating, you know, what's happening or the potential, whether that's like easier to simulate potentially. But yeah, know. yeah. I mean, I think we could definitely use uh, the outputs from, yeah, climate models to look at this. Oh. Interesting. Great. Well, I think we'll put a pin in it there. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and thanks to Carly. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining. Um, as per usual, the talks will be recorded and posted on YouTube probably tomorrow once Tavi's had a chance to edit it. Uh, Carly mentioned it, but uh, the IGS meeting in Bremerhaven is fast approaching. It's taking place in June. For those of you who submitted abstracts, you should have been receiving some information from Magnus over the last few weeks. Uh, there's no talk in the IGS Global Seminar Series for the next three weeks due to Easter and EGU and just some other scheduling conflicts. So the next talk is actually back to sea ice. So on May 3rd, we have R2, who I thought I saw in, oh yeah, there he is. R2 is gonna give us a talk um, on some of the preliminary results from the AVI spring survey with the, um, the uh, airborne survey over Arctic sea ice out of Eureka and uh, Station Nord and Thule and places like that. Uh, and then we have Mark England, Mark England, who's going to give us a talk on the climate impacts of sea ice loss in coupled simulations. Uh, and then those will be the last two talks before we all meet in person in June. And then I think we're going to take a break for summer, uh, but we'll plan to continue this up in the fall. So we've got one more set of sea ice talks in three weeks, or I guess a month. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone takes care and uh, we'll see you all in a month.